This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. All righty, welcome to episode 21 of the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Contes, and this week we have Michelle Beadle joining us. Michelle, who was one of the most recognizable faces at ESPN before taking a long <laughs> hiatus from the industry, but now she's back and she uh, she just keeps adding jobs to her resume. FanDuel TV, the San Antonio Spurs, and most recently a daily show on Sirius XM's Mad Dog Radio with Cody Decker. Michelle, thanks so much for uh, for coming on the podcast today. And I, I do want to just kind of preface our conversation by noting that like I'm sure at some point you're going to make some sort of cliche comment about how much you love Sirius XM but it is true because you talked about being a Sirius XM consumer subscriber yes. and, and listener long before you became a full-time host there so now that we've at least acknowledged that the love is genuine how much do you <laughs> love Sirius XM yeah I'm like the Aaron Rodgers I manifested <laughs> it um no I I, I it's weird. I'm one of those weird people that I don't listen to music a ton. I really am just listening to talk radio all day long, which I, it's annoying to some, my friends and family, but it's fun to talk about all the sports again. I mean, for the, for a long time, even towards the end of my ESPN stuff, um, I was only doing NBA, which I yeah. love and it's still number one, but it's, you know, to get back into sort of football and now we're in baseball, um, the pop culture that's surrounding everything. Uh, yeah. I mean, pop culture and sports have always gone hand in hand, but this NFL season has been ridiculous. <laughs> it's like bigger than anything we've ever imagined. So I love it. And there's a freedom to radio uh, that's that you just can't afford to have in TV because of time constraints and, and lots of rules. So that part yeah. I love. Um, oh, we'll, we'll get into the, the ESPN days a little bit later. But when you did leave in 2019, I think there was the assumption that maybe after a month or two, we would hear where the next <laughs> job was. Uh, then one month passed, two months passed, and all of a sudden two years passed and still no Michelle Beadle. So was that long layoff planned after you parted ways with ESPN? I mean, the year was for sure. I, I was planning on traveling and I, I went overseas for a while and I was going to do all that. And then the COVID thing sort of just added a, a, an extra year to the schedule that I wasn't right. really planning on. Weirdly though, I think you know, if it had been reversed, I probably wouldn't have taken that much time off. I actually, I, I don't know, because when I look back on it, I don't regret it. It was to say it out loud. Sounds like a really long time. Two years is insane. I think it was like 800 something days, but in it, it didn't feel that way. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed not being anywhere or not having to be anywhere. And, and more than that, I enjoyed sort of being left alone, if that makes sense. Not that my life, you know, I'm by no means bothered all that much, but in within the realm of work, it yep. was nice not to have to do that. And so, um, yeah, I kind of dug it. The year was planned. The second year was a bonus. <laughs> are, are you surprised that you were comfortable taking off that that long, like not working uh, yeah. for that long, like going from being a workaholic, yeah. to just not doing anything for that long? Did you did you almost go into shock at all? It was crazy because I would have thought for sure that the freaking out would have happened, you know, week two by week two, I would have been like, Oh, I gotta go. And it never really kicked in. You know, I had, I had my family was staying with me in LA at that time. And so there were always kind of people around like a loving circle of people. Um, and when I, when I left, I, I did leave with a bad taste. So I think that was why there was no real big rush on my end to get back. It wasn't even a, a like, a, Oh, I want to get out and do this. Just nothing. I, I wanted to do nothing. Um, and so the kick in of what do I do next did not, really happened the way I thought it would, which was the most surprising part of taking that kind of chunk of time off. You know, saying all that, it, it's fun to be back at work. It's fun to have a purpose. It's fun to have to be somewhere in the morning now. You know, it, my my boyfriend's probably also happy that, <laughs> that I have somewhere to be and people to bother. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it, was a, it was time that I loved and I don't regret and um, I would do it again if I had to. So you sort of resurfaced in uh, 2021 with a podcast for The Athletic. You later joined FanDuel TV. But joining Mad Dog Radio gets you back to the daily sports media grind. Yes. Why was the daily grind of radio appealing rather than just focusing on a podcast once a week or, or every couple of days where maybe you could have been more hmm. selective about what you're covering or talking about? What do you mean? You don't want to talk about Travis Kelsey five days a week? I do. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I actually like, I like the idea that you, 
I mean, you still can kind of control what you want to talk about. Obviously, there are the big stories of every single day that you're sort of expected to, at the very least, touch on. Um, with Cody, you know, each of us like what we like more than the other. He obviously loves baseball, having come from a baseball background. I love the NBA, so that's going to be where I'm going to push to talk about all the time. But it's nice because you can kind of put in some of the other stories that you might want to sneak in. Um, and I like the idea of getting three hours. It's To me, it's been crazy how quickly three hours fly by. A couple days before the show started, uh, I remember being a little bit nervous. I was like, oh, God, what have I done? I, I, how am I going to talk for three hours a day, five days a week? And weirdly enough, it's been fine. It's been more than fine. Like, I'll look up and I'll be like, well, yeah, we have one segment left and it's already Friday. Like, it's it's kind of crazy to go back to a Monday through Friday gig. I appreciate Fridays again. For a while there, I took them for granted. Uh, I, I appreciate my weekends. I took those for granted. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's been nice to kind of have the freedom to talk about any and all of the things. Is it, is it exciting at all to be to be able to get like nervous about work again? Because I would imagine it had been <laughs> so long before that oh, yeah. happened. Yeah, you know, it's um, well, it's nice to have jobs. It's nice to be wanted. Those are, those are always nice things. And it, it is nice to be nervous again. Like this is this is something I've not done. I've done a little bit of radio here and yeah. there, but not <laughs> like this. I mean, this is a daily grind sort of hosting it with someone else very different than what I had done in the past. So yeah, there are definitely going to be nerves that come with that. I'm on a, I'm on a channel with people who have been doing it for a really long time. Um, so all that television experience that I had, none of that matters. It's like a, it's like a brand new ball game. And that part to me is exciting. It's, it's good to feel sort of nervous and like the new kid again, after such a long time off and also from not really doing that at all. Did you know Cody before partnering with him on this show? It's weird. We knew each other. Like I, like, like we all do at this point, like via Twitter and social media. Yeah. Um, and we had exchanged tweets back in the day. Like he told me this, I didn't even know this, but he told me at some point when I was still living in, in Connecticut, I was trying to sell, and I don't even remember doing this publicly, but he said that I was trying to sell a car or something, which I did own cars when I was in Connecticut because you had to have one. And I was like, and I guess he reached out to me, but I'd already sold it. And I'm like, it goes to show, like, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I don't remember this at all. I don't even have it. I don't even drink. So it's not like I can blame it on some weird gray period. <laughs> like, no idea. But apparently, yes, we've interacted. <laughs> How, how's the the chemistry with Cody? Like, are, are you are you hosts that do a lot of prep work, like planning and, and pre-show meetings? Or do you just kind of flip the microphones on and, and let it rip? Probably more that. Um, yeah. I think we're both heavy consumers as it is. I mean, you know, we all live on these stupid little phones and we're constantly, there's input 24 uh, seven sports, everything. I mean, everything it's, it's funny when you encounter like a, and I use this term in its actual like meaning an ignorant person, like God bless them because I don't know how you do it. It's impossible to not have tons of information all the time. We're kind of more of those people and um, the chemistry is good. I mean, he is a high energy caffeinated dude and i am a little bit drier and a little bit more sort of sarcastic so i think so far it's been just an easy click uh and you don't know like you never really know we did a few fill-ins during um the summertime i think sort of a, a tryout if you will and uh and they were fun and easy and so this has been smooth sailing i remember um you working with Cody's now former TV partner, Craig Carton. Yeah. Probably uh, about a, a decade ago that you filled in for uh, Boomer Esiason a few times with, with Craig on WFA. And now Craig has his morning show on FS1. Did did he ever um, approach you about joining his show, his TV he, show? He had reached out. Um, I don't even know if it was. And maybe it was for the TV thing. He had reached out uh, before he officially jumped on board and nothing ever came of it, but it was nice. He's, he's been good about sort of reaching out over the years. And, yeah. you know, even when this got announced that we were doing it, he was good about that. So yeah, it's, it's crazy to kind of stay on the radar of someone that you, you only knew a little bit 10 years ago, which is, you know, that's a nice thing. Could you ever see yourself returning to a TV show where maybe you're more of a, a talking head again, or would you need <laughs> creative control at this point in your career? No, I mean, if it's to me, the the blessing that I've had in 90% of what I've gotten to do on television has been really great people behind the scenes. So I never really needed, as long as I knew that they were creative and we were all sort of on that same path, yeah. which I've had, <laughs> um, then yeah, I, I would be all for it. It's nine times out of 10. It truly has been people 
that like I'm, I'm getting ready to, to do a podcast with Wondery and I'm reunited with a few people back from the sports nation days, like behind the scenes. And it's, it's as if no time has passed. And I'm, I'm quite aware a lot of time has passed, <laughs> but, but it's just like, you know, we're all kind of, everyone's done so much in the past several years and then we get to come back together. So yeah, TV is never an off for me. Um, as long as it's good people and, and it's fun, then yeah, then I wouldn't say no to that. Has LeBron James contacted <laughs> Eric Spitz in an attempt to uh, to get you removed from Sirius XM yet? Not, not yet. Not that I know of. But, but, you know, I hope they'll tell me if he does because those are fun conversations. <laughs> yeah, so, and for, for anybody who, who missed that, does not know, a couple years ago on your What Did I Miss podcast, you revealed oh. that LeBron attempted to get you fired from ESPN, possibly because you joined a cast of millions in millions. in mocking the decision. Yeah. Um, were, were you made aware of his attempt as it was happening or was that something that you found out after? No, I found out after, um, in like all the chaos that ensued sort of right after I left, um, all this other information started coming out. So I kind of knew I'd gotten wind of it right as I was leaving. Uh, and then more stuff came out and I was just like, what a crap show. <laughs> Good Lord. And I, I'm, I'm sure LeBron has since apologized to you. Oh, he sent me so many flowers. How could I not forgive him? <laughs> what was it? Um, was it NBA countdown that he wanted you removed from? Yes. He wanted me replaced. And then you were eventually replaced on, on countdown by Rachel Nichols. Do you think that LeBron ended up having any influence over that decision or, or no, I mean, if he by the did, time it happened, it, it was, you know, if he did, it was short lived. Um, but you know, she did that to herself. So it's sort of one of those things where when I was on the outside watching it all crumble, it, I couldn't help but kind of laugh because I, you know, you hear things, you know, things, you're told things, and then you get to sort of stand away and watch the house burn. <laughs> you're just like, holy cow, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know how much of it was real and how much wasn't. And, um, yeah, you know, I, he's a powerful dude. I mean, I, there's no, there's no getting around that. He is an empire and an entity upon himself. And he's in, in all the respect for building such a powerful entity on, on a name and, and doing it well. Um, so yeah, it's, people are going to listen. Um, I don't think they replaced me immediately. And that, that was, I guess somebody's way of kind of having my back, but it didn't feel like it. Did you have a working relationship with Rachel Nichols before she replaced you on? Um, Countdown? We, we're civil. Uh, some people I don't trust in this business. That's one of them. Um, after, after she had audio leaked from a, a private conversation and was subsequently fired by ESPN, um, you not so subtly tweeted that karma is a bitch. Uh, yes, it is. Do you, do you think that Rachel Nichols personally influenced your departure from countdown um yeah i do i okay. i mean look she ultimately is not that powerful but i think some of the narrative that was being allowed to be played out like specifically in the new york post at the time um you know i knew where it was coming from a lot of we all knew where it was coming from and it wasn't being stopped which is unfortunate you know you invest in someone time and salary and all of those things that they had done at that point to sort of just let it go because you don't want to deal with the ramifications or the, the bickering or the whining. That's not a good enough reason, but it is what it is. Um, decisions were made. Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot, but I also learned there are some things you can't control. I, I don't regret not getting down in the trough and, and slopping around in that mess. Um, maybe at the time I had thought about it more, like maybe fighting back, but it's not a good look and I've never really done my career that way. And I, I hope to never do my career that way. I, I think, your work should stand on its own and shouldn't be a bunch of backstabbing and, and stuff that goes on behind it. It's not a good way to do it. So then I, I have to at least ask if, if Rachel Nichols engaged in what we'll say media war games to replace you on countdown. Um, and we'll say at least somebody from Maria Taylor's camp did the same to get Nichols removed from the show. <laughs> yeah. um, Jesus. Did you did you do anything similar when you replaced Sage Steele to get the job? No. Um, and I know that that narrative was floated out there, too. It's it's a I didn't have to. I mean, the decisions that were made had been made. What happens is what I've learned now is that depending on what side of that story you are, 
you sort of can now go out and play that. So you can either, you can play the victim card if that behooves you, um, or you can go on the offensive, but you do it sneakily. So it's, it's just a, it's just gross. And anyone who knows me knows I'm a little bit blunt and I'm a pretty honest person, but I'm also very sh short on patience. All of these games, it's, it feels filthy. Like it feels dirty. And I loved the job. Like I love doing NBA countdown. It was a dream gig. And when my new, um, my new contract was coming up, that was a big part of the selling point was like, do you, what, do you want to host NBA countdown? That's going to be something you can do. I was like, absolutely. It was a dream job at the time. And then that sort of all came out. And then, and I know Sage felt very much like she'd been, um, blindsided. I wasn't told she was blindsided. Like I knew what was coming. Um, so who knows? That's a stage question. You'd have to ask her what she had heard or was told. Why has ESPN continuously failed at building an NBA pre and post game show that comes even remotely close to what inside the NBA is on TNT? It's a billion dollar question, isn't it? Um, my well, is, it, is it something, do you think that, that if you were given a chance that, it, that you could have, created something like that on ESPN if you had more time? I mean, no, it's the goal. It's the gold standard. I think if given time with a crew of just a crew, right? Just keep the crew together yeah. for more than a season or two or three at a time, which I don't even know what the longest term group has been on that show. It doesn't feel like very much, but it's a no. constant rotating cast. That's really hard to build anything. And now it's become where the focal point of the show is the rotating cast. It's like a, it's glaring. It's a bummer because NBA is a great product. Um, ESPN has owns most of it. They have the finals, they have the good stuff. It should be front and center. Um, maybe this year they'll figure out. I think Malika does a great job. I like her. I know she's had to deal with a bunch of garbage behind the scenes as well. And so hopefully she's found a nice plateau and, and can enjoy it. Um, but yeah, it, it should be a fun job. I mean, those guys over at TNT, like, there's nothing about that that looks forced or or strained. They look genuinely like dudes who'd hang out and talk basketball and, and you know, Candace too in there. It's just, they've done it. They've nailed it. Um, Charles Barkley recently insinuated that Ernie Johnson could be the first person to retire from the inside the NBA crew. Is that a hosting job that you'd be interested in replacing Ernie Johnson on inside the NBA? Or is yeah. it almost kind of like having to replace Derek Jeter where yes. you'd want somebody else to do it first? You almost want like a buffer because he's yeah. the best. <laughs> You're like, let someone else do it, get crushed in social <laughs> media. Uh, and then, and then you want it. Um, it's hard. It's hard for me to even, I, first of all, Ernie is one of the most gracious humans in this business. Um, you know, he doesn't have to be, but you know, you can reach out to him. You can text him. He'll always reach right back. It's, it's very refreshing. There are a few like that, that are genuinely decent human beings. I don't ever want him to retire, but obviously at some point we all have to. Yeah. It's a, it is the dream job. It's the Holy grail. It's going to change too. I mean, Charles will step down at some point. Who knows? Who knows? I, I don't know if Draymond is who they're going to bring in at some point, but what they have now, you know, you'd like it to go on forever. <laughs> and that's the dream and hope. Um, when when you agreed to do get up with uh, Mike Greenberg and Jalen Rose, what what did you expect that show to be, or or what were you pitched on that show being? So that was pitched. You know, it was John Skipper and Greeny came out to L.A. to you know they talked to me about it, and it was going to be. I mean, the big thing it was going to be something different, right? Which every show that starts out on television wants to be something different. Um, yeah. It's very hard to do that, and I I realized that after having done four different shows that were going to be different and didn't, and didn't end up being that way. Uh, and so, yeah, we kind of wanted it. To, and under the, the, the skipper regime, things did have a completely different vibe. Things were a little bit allowed to marinate and breathe. And, and you were allowed to sort of take silly chances and, and do things. I mean, that's sports nation came during his time. There's a reason why that thing was off the rails because he, he let us do that. He left like, very soon after um, I agreed to do that and did the new deal. Uh, and, and it was, it's, it was a culture change. It was a culture change from top to bottom. And quickly we realized, and Greeny's in on, I mean, Greeny and I fought behind the scenes to keep trying to do the show and Jalen, the, the show that we wanted to do. And it just became a too many cooks in the kitchen. And it just slowly gravitated towards a little bit more of what was already on the air. I feel like they try, you know, they try to, it's a beautiful studio. I mean, good Lord, you get a brand new studio in New York city. It is the dream to have that, but it's also 
hard, depending on personnel, to to get away with doing goofy, weird things. Um, you know, and we and we tried, and then we realized quickly I'm fighting a failing effort. So, so do you wish that that show had had more time to be what it was supposed to be? Do you think it's something that could have potentially taken off, or or was ESPN not going to let that happen? I think I think they had an idea of what they wanted it to be or what they think TV is supposed to look like, or the people that are supposed to be on all of the shows there. Um, and I don't agree with that necessarily. And I think at the time, Greeny didn't necessarily agree with that either. I think at some point though, you kind of, and, and Greeny's better at this than I am realizing that we may not win this one. I'm the idiot that goes down with the ship. Like, Oh no, we can still fight. And then I was like, okay, it's, it's not happening. And Jalen's just the consummate professional. And he's, you know, he, he does, everything and he says yes and he goes in there with such a great attitude and and um <laughs> sometimes i wish i was a little bit more like that but yeah i don't even know if time would have done it i think once it became new people in place that was it do you watch football now uh for your, for your <laughs> i do show? i do i started watching again oh god probably a year and a half this is my third season back from my my boycott <laughs> my self-inflicted mm -hmm. boycott I mean, you know, not a ton has changed. Um, it's weird that we had a Kaepernick mention in the year 2023. Yeah. I, I had flashbacks, a little PTSD. Um, but yeah, it is, it is. I'm trying in my old age to find more gray instead of so much black and white. I think black and white sometimes uh, is very hard to live in and it's frustrating and also does you harm. So as much as I can, I try to find the gray. And to be honest with you, I never didn't enjoy football. I just don't like everything that happens behind the scenes, but you, you could almost say that at this point about everything, unfortunately. Was, um, was Greeny a, a rabid Jets fan when you were working <laughs> on get it? Because like in the, in the last eight months, they've portrayed him as this crazed fan who lives in, and dies by everything Aaron Rodgers and the Jets do. And I just, I don't remember the shtick being a thing previously. <laughs> Definitely a diehard Jets fan. I think with Aaron Rodgers, the the hope that was extinguished for most Jets fans, you know, they sort of just existed um, with the knowledge that nothing was ever going to come of it. You just, you go through life, I'm a Jets fan, and then you keep it moving. I think with Aaron Rodgers coming and then being so drastically taken away, uh, it was something that he and many Jets fans just hadn't felt ever and it awakened something in him. I mean, I've, I've seen it too. I'm just like, good, good Lord. <laughs> he's, I saw him today bring the Jersey like over to the table. Like it was a living creature. Uh, so he's just, he's yeah. I felt his pain. I, I have a lot of friends. It's funny. I have a lot of friends that are Jets fans. Um, just brutally heartbroken, just like, like a death in the family. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of them. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I tried. I mean, it was, I've never said something so dramatic four plays in is I've never yeah. seen that. Yeah. <laughs> um, how is working with Colin Cowherd? Uh, he's, oh. he's great for, for our business at awful announcing. He is one of the most <laughs> unique personalities in the industry. Uh, no fear in giving a bizarre take or analogy, no, no fear in being wrong. Sometimes yeah. it seems like he's rarely even right, but he is always entertaining. Yes, that was well put. He <laughs> is, um, Cause look, there are big, big names in this business that get it wrong a lot. Um, but they do it in a different way. Yeah. Colin, for some reason, it's more endearing. Now, sometimes he's gotten some wrong where I'm like, Ooh, that oh, was not a good one. You might want to say something about that. But he was, you know, when I first met him, I knew him from radio. Cause again, nerd. Um, but he, you know, he's a star. I was just some schmuck that had auditioned for this job with a hundred other people that got it. And so this thing was for him. And I was just sort of going to be the person that guides the bus. And he was so from the start giving about everything because there are names that would not allow that to happen. Like yeah. they're going to remind you that you're you and I'm me and that's how this is going to work. And he was never like that. He was willing to do whatever to make the show fun. And he laughed at himself. And, and let's be honest, the ability to sit in a room for the most part alone, which I know he now has people, but for the longest time, it was just him. It's a, it's a version of being a sociopath in like the most fun way that you could possibly be because I tried to talk to myself and I feel so weird do even for three minutes, three minutes yeah. feels like, like nothing. And you're just like, I hate this. I, I, I don't have anyone to talk to or bounce anything off of. It's a gift and it's a skill set. And he's done it for so long at such a high level. Like there's nothing, 
There's nothing I could say. There's, he's killing it. What about Max Kellerman? How was your relationship with, with him on Sports Nation? I love Kellerman. Um, I've never met a snobbier dude when it comes to fashion, and I do mean that with all my love. Uh, if it's Tom, if it's not Tom Ford, he ain't having it, and that's fantastic. He's so intelligent, and I don't even want to use the word wise. He just knew a lot. He he put it this way. I mean, we're about the same age, and he's you know had a family and kids, and then I'm me who has I have no responsibilities, so we're completely living two different lives. And I just, I adored him. Um, and I love that he could laugh at himself, which is something that, um, you know, Max Kellerman didn't necessarily always have to do as part of his career. I mean, again, he's another guy that for a long time was a solo artist in, in the yeah. starting from when he was like a kid doing his own public access stuff. And so he comes in and with Marcellus Wiley, who's just lights up the room and, and can be goofy and fun, but can also be serious. I mean, for me, for my money, when they did the radio show together out in LA, it was one of my favorite radio shows that's ever existed. I hope now that everyone's off doing their own thing, that maybe we get another version of that. But I love Max, and um, you know anyone who says otherwise is is wrong. Have you have you spoken to Max since he's been laid off by ESPN? I have. I've reached out a few times. Um, I know his name was dragged through the mud here not that long ago. I reached out for that. You know, offered my services of kicking some ass if anybody needs that done. And <laughs> that was just like, well, I think he's kind of doing what I did. I think he's sort of living his life for a little while until decides what he wants to do next. I haven't gotten into the, the weeds with him about it. I mean, I haven't done sure. that. That would be like a need to sit down in person and drink some wine kind of a conversation. But yeah, I've definitely reached out. Did you interact with Stephen A much at ESPN? No. No. Are you surprised by Stephen A's, when I mean, you just kind of alluded to this, his willingness to continuously preach that he didn't like working with Max on first take? Like it's been two years since they kind of <laughs> parted ways and he's still seemingly jumps at every opportunity to remind everyone he didn't think Max was good on the show. And honestly, I, I you haven't heard a one rebuttal from, from Max in those two Which years. Which I love, by the way. I love that he's decided to just ignore it all completely. Look, everyone could say the same thing. Here I am talking about things that happened two years ago. When asked about things, I'm never going to not answer. Yeah. Right? Like, it is what it is. It happened. This is how I saw it. Um, but it's like weird personal attacks and I, and I don't understand. Look, a lot of things happen behind the scenes on those types of shows, a lot of things. And all of us know so much and we could all just come out here and just say everything, just spew the garbage out. But I don't really know the point, right? Like it, I know that it would get a lot of attention. Uh, I know that if I just picked up the Twitter right now and decided to say a bunch of stuff that I know has happened, it would be a lot of attention gained, but what's, I don't want that kind of attention. But I do think some people do. And I think for some, any kind of attention is the oxygen that they crave. And I think in this particular case, that's what we're looking at. I, I think he's wrong. I think Max was a, a good sparring partner. Um, I think what Marcellus had to say about Max being very, very intelligent, and maybe that's just not what was being craved for an opponent, probably is closer to the truth than anything. What's, um, what's worse, trying to get somebody fired <laughs> by talking behind their back or Stephen A. Smith kind of publicly announcing over and over again uh, that he didn't like working with, with Max. So he just kicked him off first take. I mean, I'll take that 20 times out of 20. Like just if, show me the gun. I, I don't, I don't want to be stabbed in the back. Like that is, you know, cause, cause the thing about it is at least in that case, there's no real sort of faking that you're friends or whatever. I think when you do the backstabbing stuff, it's gross. Cause you know, you're trying to be nice to that person when you see him in the hallways at work. And now until the other person knows about it, then they're like, oh, we're not doing this anymore. But it's it's kind of a dirtier way to live. I don't agree with Stephen A, but at least it's out there and he and he owns the words. Are you um are you still in Texas or did you I'm in move? New York? Um and I I still have my place in Texas, but I'm mostly been in New York lately and then LA once the NBA season starts will be a lot of that as well. So kind of three places. Sort of. So do you um do you and Cody do the show from the studio together or are you yeah. always okay. Yeah, we've been doing it anytime we're in New York cuz I mean it's as you probably know doing anything live or in person is just yeah. a better product. So yeah, Definitely. anytime we're all here and Cody lives here so that's easy, but I will always go to the studio as long as everybody still wants to go to the studio. It's it's a uh, it's just more fun. It also makes it feel like a real person job. <laughs> Sometimes I forgot, like when I would do everything from home, which don't get me wrong, not wearing pants or showering, those are cool. <laughs> but um, but then sometimes you're like, no, I need this to feel like a real job. Sometimes. <laughs> are, are you still going to be working with the Spurs? 
I am, but I won't be able to do it. Just honestly, for, it's funny. They get Wemby and all of a sudden I got busy. I was like, nah, I did not time that out wise. But um, I'll get to do the games like, you know, when they come here, I'll get to do that. When on the West Coast, I'll get to do that. But I won't I won't be able to do nearly as many as I did, which is uh, is a bummer because I was very much looking forward to it. Um, an- another sports media member who spent a, a lot of time in Texas, Skip Bayless, has, has <laughs> ripped Greg Popovich a few times, calling him a... Uh, a bully because of the way he handles the media. So how have you learned to, um, to handle Greg Popovich, who has long been long been known for his curt responses to the media? I mean, I must, I must just be a charming person because I've not encountered that version of Greg Popovich at all. (laughs) Yeah. I look, I, I get it. Um, He has a way, but it's, it is so hard for me when I'm asked this question because even though I'm not stupid, I, I, I'm watching the same stuff everybody else is, but I'm also talking to Greg Popovich and you know I see him when we get on the plane. I talk to him on the plane. I talk to him in the hotel um, gym. I, like all, by the way, if I didn't finish that sentence, that was gonna get weird. Uh, I, yeah, I just, it's a different man that I know um, than everybody else does. And that's just simply luck of the draw that I, I happen to have be affiliated with the team. I've known them all for, She's going on 24 years now. So it's um it's it's just a different take. I he has lightened up. I will say that. You cannot be paying attention if you think he has not lightened up. I think having, you know, being surrounded by 19, 20, 21, 23 year olds has sort of brought this light in him. And um, and he's having fun. Like there's not the pressure that it used to be with, you know, when you have Tim Duncan and you're expected to put a banner up every year, which I get. And those were the best years of my sports fandom but it's a different kind of fun for him now and he'll tell you he's he's coaching again like really coaching and it's fun to watch um and, and he'll yeah I, I i don't think he's a bully uh i think he's just short and curt <laughs> so um who's the bigger detriment to sports media greg popovich or skip bayless oh i mean come on again for some any oxygen or any attention is the oxygen and skip has said some pretty asinine things over the years that um for the sole purpose of, i mean look maybe he believes them i don't know skip well enough to know whether he believes them my short interactions with skip years and years and years ago were fine but that again that's a, that was a long time ago i don't know what he believes and what he doesn't believe but it is a formula of television that has made a few people very very wealthy it's almost like who am i to argue with it it's just not for me um, you just you use the word asinine, and uh, that reminded me of that's that's the same word that you used after uh, it was announced that Tom Brady signed <laughs> a three hundred and seventy five million dollar contract with uh, with Fox to be an analyst. So have you have you warmed yeah. to the idea of Tom Brady as a as a lead analyst on Fox yet? Well, has he warmed to the idea? I don't of think so. Being- <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't. I don't. I will say this: I've seen more personality out of time Tom Brady in the last. <clears throat> seven, eight months than I had in his entire career. So yeah. if that's what we're going to get, like maybe this is him just sort of easing into being a normal human being in life. And and I don't even mean that disrespectfully. I mean, for a long time, he was Tom Brady, the football star. And now he's going to be Tom Brady, the human, um, which is what makes you a good announcer in any capacity. So I'm curious. Now, the amount of money is staggering. But if somebody offered me that kind of money, I would kidnap and disappear families <laughs> <laughs> so i totally get i get it um i'll be curious it, it's going to be again it, it's i've never understood the the clamoring for who announces games i'm just watching the games yeah but it is a business and it is a crazy one at that before joining sports media you were you were planning to go to harvard law with the, <laughs> the goal of entering uh, politics has that desire to enter politics ever been rekindled in, in recent years, especially God. like you, you see Stephen A. Smith all the time talks about wanting maybe, maybe uh, running for office and, and he did not go to Harvard law. So like, well, you don't need to go to Harvard law to, oh, to be no. a politician. No, we've seen that. You certainly don't. Um, no, if anything, <clears throat> the message has been quite the opposite. I almost feel like while we do need people to represent all of us, I would like for there to be some sort of bar. (laughs) It it doesn't have to be, you know, brain surgeon or nothing. Right. 
but just the bare minimum uh, of humanity and intelligence and um, just sort of a capacity to care for others. That, that's all I really want out of my politicians. What we I, I, I see now is I think I would be so frustrated if I entered that world that because what I did learn, I mean, I did have a, a year and a half, <laughs> if I don't brag about it, um, as, a, as an intern at the state capitol in Austin. And it was a whole lot of nothing, like just a lot of doing nothing. Um, and I'm very impatient, as I might have mentioned earlier. I don't think I'm cut out for it because you do a lot of meetings and a lot of this and a lot of that and a lot of posturing, which I guess is probably the fun part for people. But as far as getting stuff done, I don't think I'd like it. It's a dirty so, business. <laughs> so if not politics, then how can you change the world? Well, that comes into my vigilante theory, but I can't do that yet. <laughs> so they tell me that's illegal. I have to figure out a way around it. Um, I don't know. I think I've, I've shrunk in my world Whereas I once thought I could save a lot of it, it's now kind of been minimized to dogs. I'll save the <laughs> dogs. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, if I can start there and then maybe branch out, you know, help women, help them. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to be an idealist. Um, as you get closer and closer to your own mortality, you start to realize like, all right, let me just try to help at least four people that I know and, and something, and then I'll be, I'll feel okay. Michelle, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. <laughs> I appreciate it. Me. Yeah. And uh, best of luck at Sirius XM with Cody Decker. That's uh, 9 a.m. To, to noon Eastern on Mad Dog Radio. No, noon to three Eastern. Oh, uh, noon to three. Yeah, yeah. Noon to three. That is Michelle Beadle. I'm Brandon Contis. This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Please rate and subscribe to this podcast. Please also subscribe to Awful Announcing's YouTube page. But regardless of how you consume Awful Announcing and the Awful Announcing Podcast, thanks for listening and be good. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing Podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing.